This is episode 19 of the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast with CEO of ShapeLog, Brian Hayden. And this is really unlocking a new audience for strength training, which is exciting, but we have to contextualize the journey for them. And that's what the data allows us to do. With wearable devices, there's a manual component to it that makes it hard. There's charging, there's remembering to bring it, there's buying it in the first place, there's updating it. All these are little friction points that add up. By each contributing what we can and having all of our solutions talk to each other, we're gonna arrive at this promised land that we all know is, is just around the corner. Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. I am your host, Josh Trent, and this is your number one trusted resource for the accelerating world of fitness technology. Each week, we bring you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You'll gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse of what matters most for your fitness business in the age of exponential technologies. This podcast is brought to you by support from our outstanding sponsors. Brian O'Rourke and his family of companies, including Videri Ventures, Integris Advisors, Moon Mission Media, and many more. If you're looking for unmatched guidance, capital, insights, or a great speaker or facilitator, Brian and his partners are the go-to resource for your organization. To learn more, visit briankoroark.com. We'd also like to thank the Fitness Industry Technology Council, your nonprofit resource for reliable technology information, supported by forward-looking brands who are seeking to drive increased technology adoption in the fitness industry. Make a difference and join at fittechcouncil.org today. For episode 19, we're growing stronger and tracking while we do it with the CEO of ShapeLog, Brian Hayden. Brian has a unique background, which we'll learn about today in the show and how that relates to your fitness business and our age of exponential growth in technology. These technologies are now affecting new member orientation experiences and strength tracking like never before. I think you're really gonna enjoy this episode with Brian as he delivers a fresh perspective to what it's like as a new business in our space and the challenges and incredible opportunities that exist when we drop the walls and start sharing data and ideas for collaboration and success. If you're a club owner or trainer interested in this next generation of strength tracking or have been curious about how to use seamless technology to create a captivating first 30 days of a new club member, this is the show for you. Brian is going to share with us how forming a team of specialists in the Internet of Things and combining that with an ethos to help transform the health of millions of lives through machine learning and artificial intelligence is paving the way for what strength training is going to be in our space. As we cycle down from Ursa this month, a lot of club leaders are now filled with information, but on this show, I'm confident you'll have something tactical to take inspired action from. So let's step in right here, right now with Brian Hayden. Brian Hayden is the co-founder and CEO at fitness technology startup ShapeLog. ShapeLog is the new personal trainer. Their patented data collection platform helps gyms and trainers make more money by delivering better client experiences. Brian previously founded and ran the education technology company HeatSpring, and he now teaches B2B sales at the University of Michigan's Center for Entrepreneurship. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Josh. This is going to be really fun. We had a couple conversations in person. We just wrapped up the Fitzy Roundtable at Ursa, your company. It's providing data for better strength training. Tell us a little bit about ShapeLog, and I want to dive into your background as well. But first, what is ShapeLog? ShapeLog is a new kind of fitness tracker. We automatically track your workouts and serve up evidence-based programming. So we tell you what to do. Uh, based on what we see. And we do that without asking you to carry a phone or a wearable. We made a, a decision early on not to be a wearable device because we felt like there were good options out there for people who cared enough to download an app and type stuff in or, or carry around a wearable. We were more interested in providing a seamless user experience. And for that reason, we retrofit uh, fitness clubs and we're sort of just waiting for you when you get to the gym. And with ShapeLog, this is something where it's pieced on every cardio equipment or actual strength training itself. Do you veer into the cardio aspect or is this really focus on strength? We also made a decision early on that we'd rather be world-class at doing a few things, at least early on, than provide an average solution that does everything. Yeah. And, um, you know, when we look at, we look at this as our first product and our first product is a strength training solution. We make trackers that go on the strength training equipment and in the resistance bands and TRX bands. The service we're providing today is a group strength training class. It works for people who like group strength and who like strength training and are interested in, in that format. And there's a million data points that's on your website collected for every workout. Tell us about that. What is the million data points? Yeah, so we uh, pull data at 180 data points per second. 
We do that because uh, we don't just want to do the simple things like count weights and reps. In order to do the type of coaching and uh, evidence-based programming, we need all those data points. What I learned early on, though, is that people don't actually care about that number. Their eyes glaze over when I talk about a million data points. Yeah. And um, it goes even a step further than that. Even when we sort of aggregate the data and crunch the numbers and, and provide insights, it's really still a minority of people that care enough to really dig into it and understand it. And so we've decided that we're not going to try to push that boulder uphill. We'll provide the data for people who are interested in it. But um, what most people want is to be told what to do, and they need to trust that it's based on some good information. And so we think of ourselves as being like a GPS system where you just want to be told turn by turn how to get to your destination. And you need to know that it has a foundation in reality and that its data is being updated. If there's an accident, you want to be rerouted, but you don't necessarily need, need, need to know how the GPS got that information. You just want to know, do I turn left or do I turn right? We need to collect the million data points because it allows us to do interesting things, but uh, we, we're not asking the users or the club owners to care about those million data points. We're only asking them to care about the results we can deliver. And we'll talk about those interesting things, including how you're using artificial intelligence, machine learning. But I think people listening want to know a little bit more about your background. So you teach B2B. You're an instructor at a university. Why do you do that in combination with being the co-founder of ShapeLog? And then just give us a brief picture of how you form ShapeLog. When I was early in my career... Um, I wanted very badly to be authentic and myself at work, and I didn't see a lot of outlets to be able to do that. Entrepreneurship was really appealing to me, and I looked at learning how to start a company just like learning a trade. I, I was able to do that with my first company, HeatSpring, and I'm now doing it at my second company, ShapeLog. That's just two data points. There are so many experiences that other people have had and so many different ways to be successful in starting a company, and I, I teach because it allows me to pick my head up and see how other people are doing it and study all the, and live vicariously through other entrepreneurs. Mm. And then uh, the process of digesting that information and breaking it down to teach it to undergrads, especially smart engineering undergrads, is just so healthy for me and my decision making and it helps me think more clearly. So I think I'll always wanna teach as just part of the mix of what I do as a professional. Uh, but I would never want that to be my full-time job. I love being in the trenches. I love starting companies. And so I'm, uh, the balance is a, is a fun one for me. What did you set out to solve in the industry? What did you guys see? The team came together. You obviously saw a problem, something that the fitness industry needed. What was that? How does ShapeLog address that? I think it relates back to what I said earlier, which is um, being world-class at doing something and instead of being average at doing everything. We view ourselves as surfing a wave of technology. You know, today, sensors and hardware are all cheaper than they've ever been. And they're more powerful than they've ever been. And all of the different components fit together better than they ever used to. And so the value to the end user is just growing exponentially as all these things work better and all these things get cheaper. And so for us, it was a timing thing. All those things kind of came together and this was the right time for us. And we just kind of, the team came together around, around that. And we really saw an opportunity to provide tracking and coaching that was actually good um, and scalable and cost effective. What do you think the difference is, the main difference that is between someone who's empowered to wear a wearable device, a Fitbit or whatever it might be, when compared to using a piece of technology like ShapeLog that's on a strength tracking equipment? Someone's using a piece of equipment that tracks strength, but it's just kind of anecdotal. They're using it and they're like, yeah, I did 50 pounds today. What does ShapeLog do differently than wearables? One important thing is we track every time. So with wearable devices, there's a manual component to it that makes it hard. There's charging. There's remembering to bring it. There's buying it in the first place. There's updating it. All these are little friction points that add up and make it so that only the most interested and most motivated folks capitalize on the benefits. Ever since we, we started the company, it was really important to us to be able to work like magic in the background. That was, uh, to me, it's a, it's a very basic and simple concept, but it's there's tremendous power in it. And yeah. I, I think the, the main thing I've learned is, and, and this is 
a year into the industry, coming at it with fresh eyes, here's what I know. When we track your workouts and teach you how to do better, your performance improves. And that, that very basic uh, statement that it's hard to argue with is just something that we've, we've held tight to at our core. And I think it's what's going to make us successful in the long run. And the team has been successful in other industries. Your product designer, Nolan, has been in the IoT for 10 years. And Vic wrote the best-selling exercise physiology textbook of all time. And with your work in education around solar and things that you did with heat spring, how did those forces come together? What was your ethos with starting out and pulling all these talents together? Well, I think we, we balance each other really well. It's really fun to work in a team where people have different strengths and balance each other out. So there's a healthy tension within the company. Nolan uh, is, I mean, he's the reason that I was on board with starting ShapeLog. He's one of the most interesting, talented, smart, optimistic, fun people you could ever work with, sort of on the bucket list for somebody to work with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and it was really his vision for the, the tech. And when he presented the tech to me, I provided a more skeptical you know, view of it. And I said, well, you know, that's great that that exists, but are we sure it's solving a problem? And it took me a long time to figure out where that problem was. You know, a, a few hundred hours in physical therapy centers, fitness clubs, corporate wellness environments. It took me a while to, to understand what the problem was. But once I got there, I was more excited and enthusiastic than anybody. Uh, we, we didn't have wireless communication technology background. And so we were really lucky to land Jesse early on. And he, uh, you know, is trained as an army intelligence engineer. um, And he had oil and gas experience. So helping devices talk to each other in a gym environment, which is a pretty challenging environment. Yeah. Um, That was something he brought to the team. And he sort of accelerated our development cycle, um, you know, tenfold. That is fascinating. I love how you've diversified the force. And I just want to say that this is not something, at least in my experience here, learning about your product, you're not trying to put trainers out of business. It's just that as we talked about at the FitC roundtable at URSA, training doesn't scale. And that's a problem for trainers and and clients that want to let go of weight and also clubs that want to have member retention. So people in the United States spend more than $10 billion on personal trainers every year. What do you see ShapeLog doing to help trainers scale their services? Yeah, it's our perspective that good trainers should make more money and be more impactful and help their clients in more powerful ways than they currently can today. And and you said it exactly right. Trainers don't scale. Uh, we also think that there are a lot of trainers out there who aren't adding a lot of value. And so um, it makes it harder for the good trainers to articulate their value and charge what they need to charge or what they deserve to charge. Yeah. Um, so that they can earn a, a good living and, uh, you know, stay in the industry and give the industry a good name. The good trainers we talk to view ShapeLog as a tool to help them have better conversations with their clients, to be able to see and talk about things that they aren't able to see or talk about today because they don't have the information to to make those decisions. What kind of information do you think is most powerful in conversation? I mean, I'm thinking back to when I was on the floor for 10 years as a trainer, I would typically ask anecdotal questions. Hey, Mrs. Smith, how's your eating been? How have your steps been? This is before wearables really took off. Mm -hmm. What do you see now as far as combining the wearable with the shape log? Is there room for both Can shape log in the future ever see using wearables and its technology in harmony? No doubt. So uh, the value to the, to the users and to the trainers will grow exponentially when all this stuff talks to each other and you can have a complete picture of your client. We have to get there. And and that's not where the industry is today. Given where we are today within strength training, the information we're providing today are really basic things like weight settings. How much weight did the did they do last time? These are things that you can track, but it doesn't make sense for a trainer to be spending their time recording things or writing them down yeah. or retrieving, uh, you know, clipboards and papers. It's just uh, an inefficient use of time. And uh, there's so much friction that goes into these interactions. Anything you can do to, to, to alleviate that friction, it just just helps the trainer and, and it helps the, the users. Other things are relative strengths and weaknesses. I think that when you have an hour of time that you spend with somebody, you get a general sense of their relative strengths and weaknesses, but it's easy to forget about those things over the course of the week, working with 30 or 40 different clients. 
So to be able to have that at, at your fingertips and to be able to, to, to do a deep dive, it's just fodder for great conversations and more effective workouts. This is the first year in fitness. You're going to have such different answers in another year, right? I mean, yeah. you're going to be in clubs. And do you feel like with some of the clubs that you've been talking to, what is their level of interest with the Shape Log solution? Yeah. So here's my impression. Club owners are inundated with technology solutions and um, they're really busy and uh, in many cases undercapitalized. And that's informed our approach to be a channel partner with the clubs and provide our, our solution at no cost to the clubs. The sales cycles are incredibly long in my experience in talking to the club owners. And really, all everyone's trying to do is delight the end user. And so uh, we've just tried to take the most direct path to delighting the end user. And when we, when we can say that we'll come in at, at no cost to the club, it's, it's kind of an easy guess. So um, in a lot of ways, we're sort of punting on the club owner's interest. They're, they're all very interested in making more money and they're having a hard time parsing out who's going to be able to help them do that and who's going to be able to, to really delight their members. So we're sort of taking this approach as we're going to not tell you we're going to do it. We're just going to show you that we can do it. There's a powerful case study on the website. I was digging in before we recorded. It's how evidence-based strength training builds stronger, healthier fitness communities. Can you tell us about this case study? So ShapeLog is about a year old. So far are in three gyms and there are 150 people at three gyms in Michigan who love ShapeLog. The same approach and technology that we used to change 150 lives is the same technology that we'll use to change 150,000 lives or 50 million lives. And so I love stuff that's real. And ShapeLog's done some already some re very powerful and real things. And that's what we tried to communicate with that case study. Um, anytime that I'm wondering, you know, big picture strategy questions or, you know, anytime we're having trouble making decisions about where to take the business, we return back to the gym back to those 150 people who are having their lives change and, and love what we're doing uh, because the, the truth lies there. We're excited to scale and that's what we're, our, our plans are all around scaling over the next six months. You know, we're willing to be patient. You know, we wanna make sure that uh, we're thinking through everything and that's what we're doing in the gym today. That's what's in that case study. And we'll link the case study in the show notes. All but just one of the participants increased their work output capability. You know, I love the way that this conversation is going because I'm looking at clients' data all the time and I'm trying to figure out how can we create meaning out of this data? And I'm sure you come across this quite a bit in conversations with club owners. The data is great, but without context, without meaning, the data doesn't mean much. Are there a key few or maybe like a handful of data points mm. that you think really help people in regards to strength training and tracking strength training? Everybody wants to know where they stand with strength training. When we launched, we launched with a leaderboard similar to what you'd find at Soul Cycle or Orange Theory. And we had a big leaderboard and we were tracking instantaneous power and work within a group class setting. And almost instantaneously, we got negative feedback on that. That's because strength training is an intimidating thing for most people. And so uh, we killed the leaderboard. And then uh, we didn't really provide any comparative data to folks, even privately. We instantaneously got bad feedback on that. So what I learned is everybody cares where they stand. Nobody wants that information public. So with, within strength training, I'm a 38-year-old uh, former athlete. I'm curious you know, what my strengths and weaknesses are so that I can design my workouts around that. I wanna know, am I fit for my age? How do I stack up relative to people like me or people that I wanna be like? And, and so having access to that information and, and comparative data, but not having that be public in a strength training setting is what we found works the best. It's like a sweet spot. It's such a different context because when we look at my zone, when we look at Orange Theory, all these different things that are putting up everyone's heart rate and their effort points on a leaderboard, mm. that's way different, at least what I'm hearing from you, than in strength. And I think you're right. There is a, a little bit deeper of vulnerability when it comes to how much you bench, you know, that essential question we've heard in the fitness industry for so long, which I don't really like that question. But the death of the leaderboard in regards to strength training, why do you feel based on what you're seeing that that is really what people want, even if they're saying something different? I guess a few things. Um, we're measuring performance, not effort. 
So you can uh, deduce effort based on watching someone's performance over time, but uh, we can't tell how hard you're trying. All we can see is how well you're performing. And we can compare that to your previous performances and where you're telling us you want to go. That does put someone in a very vulnerable position because you're measuring their yeah. actual performance. We can all try hard. And, and that's like that levels the playing field. But we aren't all going to perform at the same level. And that's OK. I think people get that and understand that. And in, in golf, it doesn't stop you know, people from participating. But you need to sort of uh, contextualize that performance and make it meaningful. For a 26 handicap, it's OK to shoot 95. That's actually a great score. And so uh, I'm seeing that uh, when we're in the clubs. Actually, people who are most interested in using our product today uh, tend to be folks who are new to strength training, new to weightlifting. Just because we're, we're, we're in that uh, group strength setting, most folks who are really into weightlifting have their headphones on and are by themselves, you know, drinking, uh, you know, protein shakes in the corner. Mm -hmm. and, and this is really unlocking a new audience for strength training, which is exciting. But we have to contextualize the journey for them. And that's what the data allows us to do. Over 50 million people go to the gym now with no trainer and, and really no plan. So I can see this in an orientation process. Typically, trainers will bring in a new client and they'll do a squat assessment. They'll do an overhead reach. They'll do a postural assessment. But then when we look at what the client or what the new gym member will actually do on their own in that you know really important 30 days of them being in the club, how do you think this might change the orientation process if somebody can go through using ShapeLog, tracking their strength, tracking their workout with such finite detail? I think having a plan and having that plan be based on real information is empowering for folks who are otherwise intimidated. It's hard to argue with these results and this information, even if you're not happy with where your performance is and you'd like it to improve, to understand your performance and to have the vernacular and to understand where you're trying to, to go and to have someone you trust providing you with a plan to get there. That's why people pay personal trainers. You know, they... They, they need sort of a Sherpa to help them through the experience and over the learning curve and, <laughs> and, and develop yeah. these new habits. And so, um, you know, information is one method for doing that. And it doesn't work for everybody, but it works for a lot of people. I really like the analogy you made with the Sherpa because whether it's letting go of old weight or gaining strength, people coming into the health club facility, especially if it's their very first time, they can emotionally feel like it is a mountain. Mm. It can be challenging to let go of weight, especially if it's, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80 pounds. How do you see this plugging in for the long term in regards to client success? When we look at them, maybe working with a trainer once a month, twice a month, how might that model shift using ShapeLog in comparison to someone meeting with a trainer three times a week from now? The trainer... At $60 a session is out of reach for a lot of people. I think that initially there's an opportunity to sort of bridge that gap between in-person sessions that are not scalable and uh, allowing trainers to work with more clients and, and provide a, a better service to more clients. And then for clients to have a more sustainable relationship with their trainer um, and their gym. So, you know, I, I, I've always viewed the, the, the data and the workout planning as being sort of this magical bridge for, for both the users and for the trainers. I love that answer so much. And it's things that we discussed. We'll link some of this information from the Fit Tech Council 2017 Tech Trend Report in the show notes today. Brian, this is the last part of our show. This is the Fit Six round. It's six great questions for six real answers. Are you ready? I'm ready. Being in the fitness industry, it can be rewarding and challenging both at the same time. Can you share one of the most difficult moments in your career to grow and co-found ShapeLog and how you rose above that? One of the most challenging things that we've faced getting into the fitness industry is for people to look at what we're doing today and not see where we're headed. Uh, very early on, um, I got some feedback from a, 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 an industry veteran that says, I don't see the problem that you're solving. This was somebody that I really wanted to believe in us and I really wanted to help us and, and support us. And um, it was hard to hear. Yeah. What it forced me to do is to spend more time inside the club more time with our users and try to really understand and, and just sort of sit. I let I had to sit with that feedback. What I returned to is what, what he was seeing is that we don't solve a problem for everybody with our current solution today. I really had to get comfortable with the fact that we'd rather be world class at doing a few things um, than providing an average solution that does everything. 
and being comfortable and trusting in the fact that ultimately we'll be able to, to be a better contributor to the fitness industry if we can be truly excellent at helping some percentage of existing people solve a, one of their problems instead of trying to solve everybody's problems. And I've come back to that uh, frequently and being in, in the clubs and seeing our users really helped me do that. What is one of the best pieces of advice you've ever received when it comes to staying healthy as a professional who is in the industry, running around to gyms and having a full day as everyone does? What makes the difference for you as far as advice you've received to stay healthy? One of our contributing team members early on at ShapeBlog is Dr. Victor Ketch. And Vic is like a legend. He designed the first NFL combine. He was the first women's basketball coach at Michigan. He wrote the, the this best-selling exercise physiology textbook. And his advice was to not overlook the small moments and not let perfect be the enemy of the good and to just keep going and keep moving. Um, I mean, Vic's in his early 70s, and I mean, he looks like 30 years younger than that. And it's just because um, you just you just keep going and, and you don't stop. And that, that, that advice really rings true for me. What has surprised you the most about either fitness or technology in the past couple of years? I've been most surprised by how little technology is actually delivering on its value today. It hasn't deterred me in any way uh, about how much power there is in what we're all doing. And I really just, I think the key is when we all start working together and talking together and providing the, the ultimate value that we all know is possible for the end user by each contributing what we can and having all of our solutions talk to each other, that's when it's really gonna, we're gonna arrive at, at this promised land that we all know is, is just around the corner. Just the, how many opportunities there are to do that still today um, is exciting, but it's also a challenge. Looking at the home space, busy families over the next three to five years, what technology do you see changing that environment forever? Everybody's talking about Peloton right now. Um, and what I see is what they've done to allow families to work together toward their fitness goals and for families to have a collective fitness goal uh, because, uh, you know, it's so important to the rhythms of a family and how you organize and budget your time um, is so related. You can't, you can't just look at dad or mom or the kids uh, in a vacuum. So yeah. – uh, Providing opportunities for families to design their lives together in a way that that values fitness, I think those types of solutions are going to be poised for huge growth in the coming years. You talked about the future and how things will be radically different. And I think we're both in alignment that technology is serving the human condition, both in fitness and in wellness. But when we look at the roadblocks to growth, do you also see business opportunities with those roadblocks in your niche? What are those roadblocks and, and what are the opportunities in your niche? Yeah. The biggest roadblock are the walls that companies erect around their solutions. And uh, the more we can do to make uh, all of our solutions work together and talk together, uh, the better able we are to deliver on the promises that we're making to the end users. So, um, you know, I, I think I, I think the those those roadblocks are coming down and those those barriers are getting uh you know, more and more surmountable and everyone's talking and saying the right things. And, and just seeing that in practice over the coming years, I think is really exciting. And it's what's going to make these next few years um, some of the most exciting ever for fitness technology. Brian, you made it through. This is the last question, the intersection of fitness and technology. What does this mean to you? In other words, what new possibilities for better health and businesses do you see coming to fruition through fitness and tech? For technology to be truly scalable, and to truly do all the things that we hope it can do, it's just got to work. It, it can't uh, require the user to have to learn something new or think something new. And everybody always gives the example of the iPhone, but it's just so good. It's just, it just works. There's no instruction manual. You didn't have to figure out how to do all the things. It just worked. And I think the sooner that we can get to a, a point where all of our solutions just work, uh, the sooner that we can be delivering all the value that we all know is possible for the end user. 
Brian Hayden, thanks so much for coming on the show. You can learn more about Brian's company, ShapeLog, at shapelog.com. We're also going to link the evidence-based strength training guide in that show notes page. Brian, is there anything we missed in regards to tracking strength in this new landscape of really intimate data that people can take inspired action from? I just want to say directly to the to the listeners that um, you know we're very excited about working together and a collaboration, and I, I think that came through in a, a lot of what we talked about today. Um, so uh, hoping to reach out and connect with folks in the industry, um, over the course of the, of 2017. Also just want to thank you personally. Um, I, as I said in our conversation before, I don't know where I'd get this information and, and how I'd understand what was happening in the industry if people like you didn't, didn't do stuff like this. And I, I love the podcast format and I, I really appreciate your, your time and energy that you put into it. Thanks so much, Brian. I really appreciate that. And it's a lot of work and pride that we're putting into this because this is the information the industry needs. And you're right. The difficulty is getting it in bite-sized pieces. So I so appreciate what you said about the podcast and I received that. And we look forward to what you're doing for the rest of 2017. We'll make sure to have you back on the show at some point and talk about the next case study for ShapeLog. Thanks, Josh. The way our industry strength trains and how it tracks it is changing. Personalized workouts, automated tracking, accountability, and motivation are things that all great trainers and coaches already do. But with these retrofitted sensors that automatically track strength training workouts, trainers and coaches of today and the future now have technology on their side. Strength training is the second most popular form of exercise with health benefits that surpass many other modalities. So with the Internet of Things and sensors like ShapeLog, guiding a new member into a dynamic and engaged first 30-day experience will help a club operator's bottom line, not only by reducing attrition, but by increasing the likelihood of member results, which is why they came to the club in the first place. It's no surprise that the training model in our space does not scale, and that's a problem for trainers, clients, and fitness clubs alike. However, group training that's data-driven is a perfect marriage with personal training in the same regard, but contextualizing that data and making complicated numbers easy for people to understand must be a focus and a mission for the greatest coaches and clubs in our space for the future. Most people just want to know what to do. So whether you're data driven or want the right direction based on data your body creates, the Internet of Things is showing us. With companies like ShapeLog, we can provide trusted on-ramp solutions that benefit our users and club members for the long term. Thank you for listening to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. Here's a quick message from Brian O'Rourke. Hey, Josh, thanks so much for doing this great podcast. Friends, if you're enjoying this podcast, you're really going to enjoy following at Fit Tech Council. Follow me at Brian K. O'Rourke. And you'd really, really do us a big favor if you could go on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this and give us a five star. If you're enjoying it, please give us a five star and please share this podcast. Help spread the word about technology and the great opportunities it is creating for our industry space. Thanks so much for listening. 